So I'm here to talk about um, findings from the Canadian Health Measure Survey at Statistics Canada. And uh, because I, I realize probably there's some people in the room who aren't familiar with the survey, I'm going to spend a few slides just talking a little bit about the survey. Um, and I'm going to talk uh, about accelerometry and the specific device that we use in this survey. And I'm going to spend some time talking about the 24-hour movement paradigm. So this is movement uh, across the 24 hours, so that includes sleep, sedentary behavior, light physical activity, and then moderate to vigorous physical activity. And a shift towards looking at movement in a more holistic way has really changed the way uh, we measure physical activity and movement and the way that we develop guidelines and the way we look at relationships between movement and health. And so the real crux then of this presentation is what have we learned about health uh, from using the accelerometer and the CHMS, so I'll spend some time there. And then I'm going to finish by talking about some knowledge translation work that has uh, happened in relation to this survey, and then I'll talk about where we're going next. So this is a map of Canada, and uh, I just wanted to show this to, to talk about some of the... Um, the qualities of this survey, but also some of the limitations with it. So uh, the Canadian Health Measure Survey is unlike any other survey we do at Statistics Canada. So Statistics Canada does a lot of surveys, so questionnaire, over the phone, uh, in person. And at some point in the early 2000s, it was recognized that we had some real gaps in knowledge, that we didn't really truly understand health risk factors, health outcomes, health conditions, because we weren't directly measuring anything. And so the idea was to um, take the model of NHANES, or the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in the United States, and try to come up with a Canadian version. And the Canadian Health Measure Survey is what was born. So I have this picture here of tractor trailers. And so these three tractor trailers actually have to travel across the country and set up station at various cities uh, across the country. And over the course of about two years, we collect data on between 5,000 and 6,000 people. This survey has been in the field since 2007, uh, continuous, and we, so we have uh, now five cycles of data collected. We're in the sixth cycle right now. And so all the little dots across the, the bottom of the, the map there uh, represent the sites where we have collected data. And it's important to recognize that this is, those sites are chosen based on where the majority of the population in Canada is, um, but also it, it shows one of the limitations when you're actually doing direct measures and you're traveling across the country. You can't call you know, people in a more representative uh, provincial sample. So it's, a, it's called what we, what we would call a clustered sample. And we have to do a lot of statistical weighting and uh, uh, procedures to make sure that the, the data are nationally representative. So, so the data are considered nationally representative of the 10 uh, provinces, but we do not go into the territories at the moment. Um, and the age range, I should say, also is between 3 and 79 years. So I'm going to just walk you through the three phases of the study. So we start with a household interview, and this takes about an hour and a half, and this happens in an individual's home. At that time, we would also collect water samples and uh, air quality samples in the home. Then participants are invited to about a two and a half hour visit to the mobile examination center. And then the third step is... Uh, deriving all of the uh, measures from the samples taken in the mobile examination center, and then of course creating uh, the data sets from that. So just to talk a little bit more specifically about that first household questionnaire, there's a lot going on in this slide, but I just wanted to show you kind of the breadth of topics that would be covered in the questionnaire. And the focus uh, generally for me is around you know, physical activity and sleep, the socio-demographic characteristics and the chronic health conditions. What you're seeing across the top or with the little bubbles is just showing that some of the content is always there. We keep it in every single year. Some of the topics down below, oral health, visual health, bone health, some of those things come and go uh, over time throughout the survey. That's a partly uh, a financial uh, limitations. It also gives an opportunity to bring in other measures. And then also a lot of these measures don't change every single year. So measuring them every five years or every 10 years is, is considered adequate. So the mobile examination center, uh, there's just a few pictures here of what it looks like inside. And I'm going to be talking a lot today about the accelerometer uh, part of that measurement. So after this clinic visit, participants are given an accelerometer to wear around their waist for seven days. And they have to mail it back to, to the clinic after that. So I just wanted to show a few pictures here to give you a flavor for some of the testing that goes on. 
So you can see a child doing a, a grip strength test here. This is a step test uh, of, uh, to get cardiovascular fitness. You can see waist circumference. We have spirometry for lung function. So very similar to NHANES if you're familiar with, with that survey. And then finally, this is the, the laboratory steps. So really, uh, from, from blood, urine, hair, air samples, a whole host of biomarkers are, are collected and, uh, and create a database that is, is available for researchers in Canada to apply, to analyze, and work with in the future. So switching gears now to talk about the accelerometer that we use. So we're currently using the Actical accelerometer, and we're using it on a waist-worn belt. This is an omnidirectional accelerometer measuring motion in every direction. You get raw data in the form of counts and steps, and a count is really a reflection of um, time and intensity to reflect how sort of fast somebody is moving or how the magnitude of their activity. And that alone doesn't really uh, give us a usable uh, piece of information. So what we have to do is apply intensity thresholds uh, to divide the person's day into time spent sedentary, light, and then moderately active or vigorously active. And this is what we call a waking hours protocol, and this is what we're using right now. So individuals are told to put on the monitor in the morning and then take it off before they go to bed. I'm gonna come back to this towards the end of the presentation. What we're moving towards is a 24-hour protocol, so we'll have objective measures of sleep, and that is gonna change uh, a lot of uh, what we have av available to us for uh, research potential. So just to give you a sense of what, this would be one person's data from the CHMS, seven days of data. So you see seven distinct clusters of data, and then you see the, the sort of zero counts that are happening overnight as the monitor probably sits on a bedside table. And just to visually give you a sense of what the thresholds look like, we apply these, these thresholds. So the bulk of the day for adults, it's about eight to nine hours a day is in that sedentary behavior intensity. Then you have light, moderate, and this person has no vigorous, but up at the, the top end, you would have vigorous physical activity. So a lot of this background and method work, uh, the cut points, our data reduction procedures have been published in the literature over the years. And a question that we get or we struggle with um, at Statistics Canada quite a bit is why use accelerometers? They cost a lot of money. Um, they're difficult to uh, logistically to have in the field uh, for the staff working on the survey. And it would be a lot easier if we could just ask people how active they are. And so I'm going to spend a few minutes just talking about um, sort of the differences between self-reported physical activity or movement and, and accelerometry. And there's the, about, I don't know, 10 years ago, there was a lot of work looking at, at comparing these kind of apples to apples and trying to figure out um, why they weren't lining up. And often we would uh, talk about the reported activity as wrong and the accelerometer activity as correct. And then we would say things like people were over-reporting or under-reporting their activity. And since then, there's been a bit of a shift away from that and recognizing that these are, in fact, measuring very different aspects of the same behavior. So an accelerometer is, is really getting at someone's perceived time spent in a specific domain of physical activity. So we ask about leisure time recreation, uh, transportation, so walking or cycling to school or work, um, and then activity that might happen at, at work or um, around the home. Whereas accelerometry is not getting at that at all, it's really just getting actual movement and we're able to divide it into different intensities, but it is not telling us anything about the context of, of the physical activity. And so both methods have their pros and cons. Of course, reported information always has a bias potential and especially with something like physical activity, we all like to appear more active than we actually are. It's actually very difficult to recall all of our activity, especially when you get down to uh, the lighter intensity physical activity or sedentary behavior. Sometimes it's hard to remember everything. But on the flip side, accelerometers, as I said, don't give you any context, and they're limited in their ability to measure things like cycling, uh, inclines, and carrying loads. And so really, the, um, uh, the research in this domain and the recent papers have really said, you know, we need to stop talking about these as interchangeable uh, methods and really talk about them in a more complementary way. And if I've completely lost you, I'll finish with an example which usually wraps this up pretty well. If you think about ice hockey, um, if you played ice hockey, you usually play for an hour. If someone asked you on a health questionnaire, how much time did you spend 
you know, on Wednesday night in physical activity, you would rem remember your hockey game and you would say, well, 60 minutes of activity and hockey's pretty intense. You're usually pretty hot and sweaty by the end of it. So you would say, yeah, that was moderate to vigorous physical activity. But if, a, if you actually wore an accelerometer, because of the nature of hockey being stop and start, um, we would probably only pick, about, pick up about 15 to 20 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity. And so that, that gap there is, is what we're grappling with all the time when we're trying to mash these two together. And, uh, and it's unfortunately not systematic even within a given activity and between activities. There's no way to really have a, say, a, a direct correction factor or anything like that. So we've done a bit of this work uh, because we need to understand whether our questionnaires uh, are lining up with our accelerometers at all, because we, we, we do have other health surveys that only use a questionnaire. So we've recently been looking at what is the correlation between the various domains of reported activity. So you see along the y-axis here, these are the reported domains of physical activity, recreation, transportation, occupation, and household. And then they're summed together to give a total. And then we're just showing the Pearson correlation coefficient uh, with the measured physical activity. The different color bars represent all minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity, and bouts of physical activity is the blue bar, and then light intensity physical activity is the black bar. So what I want you to get a, take away from this slide is really that recreation and transportation are doing what we would expect them to do, so they relate in the positive direction with measured moderate to vigorous physical activity, but you can see that uh, here, the occupational one does not. It's going in the wrong direction, and in fact, it's correlated with light physical activity. So this was an important learning for us just to, even though we intended in our questionnaire and we told people to only tell us about activity that made them out of breath or sweaty, they were really capturing more light intensity physical activity there. So the best variable to use if you want to line up uh, as close as you can with the accelerometer is really the sum of recreation and transportation. But you can see we're still talking about a very modest correlation coefficient, so it's, it's not perfect, and I'm working with, this is adult data, I'm working with youth data right now, and it's uh, terrible. <laughs> so the other thing we were interested in was just, are there characteristics about people that make them report their activity uh, you know, more accurately or differently? And so we, we didn't find anything too consistent with age or gender, um, but with uh, activity level, there was a bit of a trend starting to show up. So what we did is just divide the sample into quintiles of physical activity level uh, based on the measured data. And what you're seeing uh, for the lowest four uh, quintiles is that the reported is higher than the measured. And then for that most active quintile, they actually are reporting less than is measured. And I'm being very careful here to not say over-reporting and under-reporting. They're really just that they're different. So the other way that we can grapple with this too is to look at how it relates to health outcomes. So we know from uh, a large body of literature that physical activity and obesity are related. So uh, we should expect to see a relationship when we look at these variables. So we looked at body mass index and waist circumference. So along the, the x-axis, we're looking at a, a change uh, in body mass index or waist circumference for every 30 minutes of various measures of physical activity. The top part here is our measured variables and then the bottom part is the self-reported variables. So what I want you to get from this slide is really just that, uh, for the most part, everything is going in the right direction. Physical activity is associated with, in a negative way, so with a reduction or lower levels of obesity or lower waist circumference. But you can see that the measured variables are, have a much stronger effect size than the reported variables. And that's been observed before, and that's important for us to know, and that sort of is, is one of the reasons why we still uh, think it's really important to have that objective measurement of physical activity. There's, there's obviously aspects about knowing true movement uh, in relation to health uh, tells us something more than we can get from the reported activity. So switching gears now, just to talk about this shift that's happened um, in the recent years uh, towards talking more holistically about movement, there's a sedentary behavior research network that has done a lot of uh, consensus work around how we should be defining things like sedentary behavior or light physical activity and how we should be dividing this 24-hour exposure. And so this, I, you probably can't see the, the writing up here, but it's really just dividing the day. So in the purple, it's uh, you know sleep, uh, and the green is physical activity of various intensities. And then the blue along the bottom here is, is, is sedentary behavior. 
And in Canada, we now have shifted away from standalone physical activity and sedentary guidelines and have put them all together into 24-hour movement guidelines. So these currently exist for preschool-aged children and school-aged children and youth. The adult guidelines are actually uh, in progress right now. We should see them come out, I think, next year. And so uh, if you actually go and search for a Canadian physical activity guideline, you won't find it now. You'll come straight to this and you'll see a screen time guideline, a sleep guideline, and a physical activity guideline all in the same place. So from a surveillance point of view, and this is one of the key reasons why the, the CHMS exists, is to help us understand at the population level how active are people across the lifespan and is anything changing over time. So I'm just going to spend a couple slides giving you a quick overview of what we've seen uh, over the last uh, few years with, with meeting the guidelines. So just as a refresher, I'll tell you what those, those targets are. So for very young children, it's 180 minutes per day of any intensity activity. Uh, for children and youth, it's 60 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity, and for adults, it's 150 minutes per week. So screen time guidelines, we only have them for children, so less than an hour per day or two hours per day. And then sleep varies depending on age, so it goes down as we get older. So for physical activity, it basically starts out good and then goes downhill as we go into the older age groups. Um, about three quarters of preschoolers, preschoolers are meeting the guideline and then about half of children and it goes down from there. But one thing I wanna point out uh, if, with those children and youth, one thing is a, a really strong sex difference there. It's almost double uh, the percentage of boys than girls are meeting the physical activity guideline. So that is something that is always highlighted when we look at these data. The gender difference becomes uh, more muted as we go on in, into older ages. So I know I'm here to talk about accelerometry, but I'm gonna take a little segue here to talk about screen time because that is what the guideline is. So this is actually reported screen time, and I'm gonna spend some time in a couple of slides talking about why I'm not talking here about the accelerometer measured sedentary time because we do have those data, but we don't have guidelines that are related to the accelerometer measured piece. Uh, and I'll talk about why in a few minutes, but for reported screen time, we are doing better with young children really not well, um, or sorry, we're, we're not doing well with young children, then we get a bit better with the five to 11 year olds and then it goes down again with youth. And then you may be wondering what's happening with adults and older adults, and we currently don't have any sort of sedentary behavior guidelines in Canada for those age groups, but they probably will be forthcoming in this process of getting 24 hour movement guidelines. And I can say um, that we are starting to collect data about different behaviors, sedentary behaviors at Statistics Canada. So instead of just asking about screen time, we're moving into asking about passive commuting and also sitting time at work and at school. So then we'll, we'll start to generate the data that we need to better understand how those specific behaviors uh, might be related to health. So sleep is the same thing. This is reported sleep data right now and we're moving towards getting objectively measured sleep data down the road. Um, but again, similar to physical activity, it's, it's higher in the younger age groups in terms of percentage meeting the guideline and then goes down over time. Um, and then many adults also report trouble uh, with quality of sleep and difficulties falling asleep. So just in summary, uh, physical activity, we're doing well, young children, and it's going downhill, sleep is a similar situation, and then screen time varies uh, with age, where we're doing better with that, that sort of younger, the five to 11 year olds, than the very young children and youth. And we've done some work, now that we have 10 years of data, to look at whether there's been any appreciable change over time, and there really has not. Uh, what's here is percentage meeting the physical activity recommendation for children and youth and adults. We did uh, look at a lot of other variables related to this, whether there's been a shift, say, in number of days that people are meeting their target, um, but there's really been uh, not a lot of change. So it's remained pretty stable. So one of the unique advantages of accelerometer data is that you have a timestamp to it. So you can actually know when people are obtaining their physical activity or when they're sedentary. So this is, uh, this is older data from about 2012. We published just looking at two hour blocks across the day, and then the various colored lines are different age groups. So the top age group is your youngest uh, age group, and then it goes down to youth, and then the bottom purple line is, is adults. And so what you can see here is that there's distinct peaks at about lunchtime uh, for young children, and then again, kind of after school, whereas for adults, they're getting less physical activity, but it's also very stable across the day. 
Um, from a descriptive point of view, it's also just interesting to be able to see that weekdays are generally more active than weekends in the population. Um, so that, that tells a nice descriptive story and is useful for surveillance, but what the next step from that is does it matter sort of how or when physical activity is accumulated when it comes to health? And so some re re researchers have done work uh, on this at Queen's University looking at this idea of a weekend warrior. So if you remember, the adult guideline is 150 minutes per week, which means it's sort of open. You can accumulate it a little bit every day, say 20 minutes a day, and meet the guideline, or you could get 150 minutes in one day and, and still be uh, in the same place. And so the question was, you know, does it matter? Is it better to spread it out across the week, as you can see with the calendar on the left side, or could you be a Saturday, Sunday, and, and get it all there? And so this, this study just sort of reaffirmed that it didn't really matter. It was really more about the total volume of physical activity accumulated. The daily aspect of it uh, was not as important. And so that's why that, that guideline is the way it is, which is different to the evidence uh, in children, where there is more evidence to show that a little bit every day is important for health. So this same group looked at the difference between bouts of physical activity and sporadic physical activity. So the guideline is 150 minutes per week accumulated in bouts of 10 minutes or more. And so what that means is the, the MVPA, or the moderate to vigorous physical activity on the accelerometer, you actually have to accumulate it for 10 consecutive minutes for it to count. And so that obviously, if you use that variable, the bouted variable, you have much lower MVPA across the day because you're missing all of those single minutes that people might be accumulating. So on the left, you see a mother chasing a toddler and you see somebody playing hockey. They would be accumulating a lot of minutes of MVPA, but they might not be in bouts, so we would call them sporadic. Whereas if you go to the gym and run on the treadmill for half an hour or an hour, you would definitely be getting what we would call more bouted physical activity. And so they found that uh, same thing, it didn't matter. Any minute should count uh, when it comes to metabolic syndrome risk. And this is in line with a lot, this came out in 2014 and there's been a lot of other papers that have come out reaffirming this. So the guidelines are under review and revision right now in the United States and in Canada. And so I think we'll see a departure uh, based on the evidence away from this bouts and messages more about that are a little bit more inclusive saying any physical activity is good. Um, you know, don't get confused by this whole uh, bout aspect. So to talk a little bit now about the accelerometer measured sedentary time. So we have these data, um, but alone, without any processing, they have not been that useful. So we know that adults get about nine and a half hours per day of sedentary time on average. Youth, it's about eight and a half hours. The trouble with sedentary time is that many sedentary pursuits are normal and healthy. They're also ubiquitous throughout the day, so they happen in little, little spurts here and there. So it's difficult to kind of tease out what is the amount or volume that is, is good for health or bad for health. And some of them may be things that we don't really uh, want to intervene on. You know, workplace uh, physical activity or, or sedentary beha behavior is sometimes able to be changed, and there's, there's a lot of initiatives now trying to get people to stand more at work, um, but sometimes that cannot be changed. I don't know if we want to take an intervention about napping, probably not. Uh, reading is kind of a good thing. Now, screen time is one where we do want to take action, and there's a lot of policies and interventions happening around that one. So it's a tricky one because there's, there's behaviors that we, we want and then ones that we don't want. So a challenge analytically is just figuring out how much is too much, and that is really the wrong question. It's really what type uh, of sedentary behavior is, is too much or the wrong type. So what we've seen uh, over the past... Uh, probably decade as well, is kind of this emergence of different uh, sedentary variables. And a lot of this uh, work started with uh, Jen Healy in Australia, looking at patterns of sedentary time and also breaks in sedentary time. So new variables like long stretches of sedentary time were created, and then we also looked at how often sedentary time is broken up throughout the day. And so in adults, we do see um, relationships with very specific health outcomes, so with insulin, uh, blood pressure, more breaks is associated with lower triglycerides, lower waist circumference, so we do see um, once we do more processing and working with the sedentary data um, that you can get something to come out in relation to health. In kids, we generally don't see very much coming out, 
And that doesn't necessarily mean there's no story there. It could be um, the challenge with children is that we often have still a very healthy sample. And even though children are overweight and obese, they may not be showing the biomarkers or the high triglycerides or the high cholesterol um, that we would see uh, in, in adults. So the graph here is just to really show analytically what um, the analysts are trying to, to figure out when they're looking at their raw data. So you would have these sedentary bouts and trying to figure out how long those bouts are and then trying to compare whether it matters if the break was into moderate to vigorous physical activity or if it was just into light intensity physical activity. And then they've also looked at, does it matter how long the break was? So there's a lot of potential and a lot of possibility um, to get it, uh, deeper into these data. <clears throat> so one thing I want to touch on uh, briefly too is just the untapped potential of, of we, a dyad file that we have with the CHMS. So, this is typical of some large, other large uh, health surveillance studies. When we sample a child under the age of 12 in the CHMS, for logistical reasons, we always also sample a second person in that household. And that second person, uh, and we do that because that, that person usually has to bring them to that clinic visit, and they're there anyway, so it makes sense to collect data on them. And that second person is often a biological parent, not always. Sometimes we get an older sibling, sometimes it's a grandparent who's living in the household. Um, but by and large, it's mostly biological uh, parents. So this gives us a unique opportunity to be, to be able to look at child-parent pairs living in the same household and gives us a lot of different potential to ask research questions about health behaviors and also health conditions. So, so far we've looked at physical activity, sedentary behavior, and obesity, and found relationships for all of those between parents and children. Um, and this, the graphic here is from an infographic that we, we have at Statistics Canada, just to kind of summarize the, some of the findings, but it's pretty blurry for you guys, I think, but every 60 minutes of a parent's physical activity is associated with an extra 15 minutes of a child's uh, physical activity. And then we also um, looked at support for physical activity. So parents who put their kids in physical activity, um, those kids are generally more active and those parents are actually more active as well. And we don't know whether that's co-participation or if they're refereeing or coaching, but um, there's, a, there's a positive effect for them as well. And then not related to the dyad file, but just some work by Richard LaRouche um, at the University of Lethbridge has done a lot of work just looking at the association between time spent outdoors and physical activity and found a positive association there as well. So back to the 24 hour movement paradigm. Um, this has uh, changed the way we look at the relationship between movement and health. So in the past, we've done a lot of research looking at physical activity or MBPA and health, whether it's metabolic syndrome or obesity or what have you. Now there's a shift towards wanting to look at everything together. So what is the effect on health of shifting time between various intensities of movement? So to walk you through, just as a reminder, our day is a fixed 24 hours. We can't go beyond that. So if we wanted to ask the question, what happens when we increase physical activity, we can't go above that dotted line uh, because we have the fixed day. So if we want to increase MVPA, either light physical activity decreased, or sedentary behavior decreased, or sleep decreased. And it would be nice to know if we could figure out whether it mattered where that time came from. And so there's a few statistical techniques that have uh, emerged uh, to try and tackle this. One of them is compositional data analysis, uh, and the other one is isotemporal substitution. So I'm gonna talk about a paper that just came out about a month ago using isotemporal substitution which is a variation on regression, which allows you to estimate the effect of substitu substituting a specified amount of time in one movement intensity for another while controlling for total time and your covariates. And so I'm gonna walk you through a few graphs here and just to, to show you what we found. So the setup of the graph is always gonna be the same. So body mass index and waist circumference was our outcome. All of these uh, along here are all the shifts. So the, the top, it's sleep to light physical activity, sedentary to sleep, sedentary to light physical activity, and then the bottom three are everything to moderate to vigorous physical activity. So sleep or light or sedentary, moving to exercise or MVPA. So what you wanna sort of gather from this uh, figure, and we're looking at change again uh, for every 30 minutes of physical activity along the x-axis here, so any shift to moderate to vigorous physical activity seems to be beneficial. And then you can see that shifting time between sleep or light or sedentary doesn't seem to matter when it comes to obesity as the outcome. 
So we also then looked at this with different outcomes. We looked at uh, self-reported general health, which is a very strong indicator of, of a person's overall health status. And then we also looked at self-rated mental health status. So what I want you to see here is if you look at, on the previous slide, any shift to MVPA was good. But here, we, for general health, that is also true. We see that any shift to MVPA is good. But for mental health, not at all. And this was, in some ways, a little bit surprising. But if you look at the literature around the link between physical activity and mental health, it's very mixed. And so it depends on what type of mental health uh, you're looking at, if you're looking at specific mental health conditions versus an overall mental health um, you know, rating by a person. Those are very different metrics. So I think, so we weren't actually that uh, concerned about it. There's, there's uh, a whole body of literature just talking about how a general question, overall mental health, isn't really getting at the minutia maybe that we would expect to see. But if you were to look at depression specifically with moderate to vigorous physical activity, I think you'd see more of a relationship there. And then the other thing to notice here that we didn't see when we were looking at the obesity outcomes is that shifts, any shifts away from sedentary were beneficial for both general health and mental health. So just getting more sleep instead of sitting, watching TV, screen time, sedentary activities, or shifting to light physical activities, so that would be you know, slow walking, gardening, uh, general chores around the house, that kind of thing, were beneficial for both. So that was uh, an interesting finding for us. So the next step with this uh, that we looked at in this paper, so we're going back to the same setup, same outcomes, so body mass index and waist circumference as our outcomes. But I want you to look at this picture here. We have a young, sort of teenage-looking boy walking with an older man. And uh, I became interested in this age difference, just looking at the literature. There was a, a paper in just a sample of older adults uh, looking at um, I, using isotemporal substitution, and they found that shifting from sedentary to light was beneficial in this older population. So I wanted to see if that was true as well in our sample. So I'm basically doing exactly what we did in the first slide from this study, but I've split it into a 50 plus is the blue lines, and then less than 50 years old, so that would be 18 to 49. And so the first thing to notice is that we see the same thing with the shift to MVPA, but the effect size was greater for the older individuals. And the other thing that we did see, similar to what uh, Buman and colleagues observed, was that a shift, just going from sedentary to light intensity physical activity, was beneficial only for older adults, wasn't enough for younger adults with the obesity outcomes. And the reason why uh, this is happening, or it's postulated in the literature, is that as we get older, our gait becomes less efficient, and we actually burn more energy for a given pace of movement. And so we, aren't, we use the same cutoffs to define moderate activity in the CHMS. And that actually puts older people at a disadvantage because they, they're actually working harder at a given pace of movement than their younger counterparts. So the fact that we're seeing more of an effect for lighter movement uh, makes sense here. So we also did the same thing looking at overweight and obese versus healthy weight people. And the same thing to sort of think about these images and uh, the same problems with gait. So uh, the more overweight or obese somebody is, the less efficient their gait becomes, and therefore they're burning more energy. So we saw the same thing, a greater effect size for any shift to MVPA, but we also saw that for just the overweight and obese group, those shifts to light intensity physical activity uh, were starting to show a benefit. And so the conclusion of this work is really to help contribute to the, the ongoing development of the, the new physical activity guidelines and because at the population level, having individualized cut points for different ages and different obesity status becomes very complicated and huge sample sizes that we have. And so I think by keeping those constant, the flip side of dealing with this is that perhaps we need messages encouraging people if they're, you know, if they're sedentary or if they're older, if they're overweight or obese, having messages about the importance of light intensity physical activity in addition to moderate to vigorous physical activity are probably warranted. So I'm coming to, towards the end here, I just wanted to highlight uh, the Active Healthy Kids Canada and Participation Report Card. So this is an annual publication that's been coming out in Canada since 2004. It now comes out every two years. And uh, the idea of this report card is really just to, to highlight uh, where we are with physical activity uh, in Canada and Canadian kids. And the Canadian Health Measures Survey has been a huge player in driving the grades uh, for this report card. 
and uh, having to measure data in addition to reported data from other sources from across the country has been very beneficial. So we continue to work with participation now on doing custom analyses for them. And the next report card is actually coming out, I think, June 19th um, in Canada. So the future of accelerometer measurement in the CHMS, uh, a few changes are forthcoming. And so we're going to be switching from the ActiCal to the ActiGraph device. And we're also switching, as I mentioned, from a waking hours to a 24 hours protocol. So I'll be paying attention to the next talk quite a bit um, because one of the things that we'll have to deal with is how do we derive meaningful sleep measures uh, from that nighttime accelerometer data. Uh, in cycle six, which is in the field right now, we're doing some crossover studies to compare ActiCal to ActiGraph, and we're also comparing the two protocols. So we wanna be able to understand both of those adjustments. So I don't know if you can see this, but we're, so we're gonna work on that one adjustment. So just looking at the difference between the devices, but then we have to work on the, the difference between uh, the protocols and what effect that has on the data. We're still grappling with uh, the waist-worn versus wrist-worn um, question. So we currently use a waist-worn device. Both the ActiGraph and the ActiCal can be worn in both locations. It's just a matter of do we have the analytical procedures uh, ready uh, to be able to switch to the wrist. And the other problem is that wrist works better for sleep while waist generally works better for physical activity measurement. So when you're trying to do everything, uh, it is a difficult discussion to sort of come up with an optimal approach. So that's something that we're, we're grappling with right now. And by 2020, we will have a new, new device, a new protocol in the field. And the goal with that, all of this crossover work, is not to be able to uh, correct the data or adjust the data in any way. It's really just to be able to understand when we do a 20-year trend in physical activity in Canada that if there is a, an apparent increase or decrease in overall levels, we want to know whether uh, any of that is, is attributable to the device or the protocol changes. And in terms of analysis in the future at Statistics Canada, as I mentioned, the objective sleep data will change things for us with the 24-hour movement paradigm research. We'll probably have uh, more information about sleep quality um, than we do right now inst instead of just sleep duration. Uh, we work a lot with linkage to administrative data sets at Statistics Canada. So um, CHMS has only been around since 2007. So we're getting to a point where we can start to look at following people up for mortality and looking at health behaviors uh, you know, in 2007 and, and what people have died from. We, know, we don't have that sample size yet, but we do have other data sets at Statistics Canada, such as the census, the CCHS, which is a, another health survey. Um, we look at that follow-up and we look at what people are hospitalized for. We also li can link to, um, to data to, that shows where people have lived over time because the, this integration with built environment data is becoming uh, uh, an emerging topic of interest uh, for the government in looking at issues around walkability, uh, proximity to healthy food or unhealthy food, uh, neighborhood deprivation scores, crime, uh, proximity to greenness. So that's all stuff that we're, we're starting to look at now uh, moving forward. And I'm gonna finish there. Thank you very much for your attention and the opportunity to speak.